Well, good morning, West Coast Word Church. Hallelujah. It's good to be in church. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm excited what the Lord has for us this morning. Um, Jeff, is Jeff in the, in the room? Or gentlemen, it's a little echoey up here. Maybe you could turn it down a little bit. Um, I'm teaching in a series entitled The Filling. And this teaching series has talked about a few different topics, one of which we've talked about the topic of drugs, alcohol, abuse, and how the filling of the Holy Spirit is something that can help our lives and is designed by God and given to us by God to fill our lives so that we don't have to settle for second best. We don't have to settle for something that the world has to offer and a cheap counterfeit. That the filling of the Holy Spirit has been given to us and for us to bring true satisfaction to our lives. And when a person is under stress or a person just wants to relax and instead of turning to, you know, alcohol or instead of turning to you know, drugs or marijuana or something like that, that the Holy Spirit was God's original plan for mankind to receive of and to be filled with. And that the filling of the Holy Spirit would and can bring a satisfaction unlike anything else. Now in this teaching, it's so important that we learn and understand how to live by the Spirit. The Bible tells us that to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And so what, is, what does it mean to live a Spirit-filled life? Well, first of all, being filled with the Spirit has almost become a, a badge or a, um, you know, a way of explaining somebody or an identifier of, some, of who somebody is. But being filled with the Spirit isn't who we are. Who we are is a child of God. And what we receive is we receive the filling of the Holy Spirit. So it's not who we are, it's what we receive and partake of. And it's important to know that because in the New Testament, there's evidence that being filled with the Spirit was God's plan for our life, for us to be Spirit-filled, for the believer to be Spirit-filled. Now, I know that when you even say the word Spirit-filled, that to some people, and a lot of people probably unfortunately, that is a turnoff to them. They kind of like, okay, one of them churches, right? And I understand it. I get it. Because I've grown up in church. And we've been part of all kinds of different denominational backgrounds. Assembly of God, Baptist, you know, Pentecostal, Word of Faith, you know. We went to, man, we went to, I don't know what this one church was. <laughs> I, do, I don't know what it was. I mean, Jesus People Church. I mean, we've been to all kinds of different churches and denominational backgrounds. And so I get it. And I've seen some, I've seen some stuff. I'll just say it like that. I've seen some stuff. <laughs> I mean, some stuff I've seen. <laughs> I think back, you know. And people are people. I don't care if it's from the 1970s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2018, people are people. And people will get it wrong. And people will get emotional, even about the things of God. For goodness sake, they get emotional about a sport, sporting event. You don't think they can get emotional about the, the Spirit of God? Not everybody celebrates Jesus the same way. And not everybody celebrates a touchdown or a home run or a goal the same way. Okay? All right. Right? 
And so why do we become so opinionated about the way people celebrate Jesus? Well, I don't think they're doing it right. Well, that's them. They're not telling you you have to do that. That's how they celebrate Christ. That's how they celebrate the anointing. You don't, maybe, maybe you don't know the dark place that they were at. You start walking in the light after you've been in a dark place, that's something to celebrate. And if they get a little excited about it, let them get a little excited about it. I'd rather see people excited about Jesus than about anything else. And so this teaching here, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, if you have your Bible, go there. I recommend you bring your Bible. I mean, if you go to the mall, women, you bring your wallet. If you go to church, you bring your church, you bring your Bible, right? <laughs> if you go to the golf course, you bring your golf clubs. If you go to church, you bring your Bible. Or bring something to look the scriptures up. Why? So you see it yourself? Well, you got the screen up there. Yeah, but I want you being used to going to your Bible. I want you being used to being able to pull it up and recall it and look it up when you're not in this room. Amen? Take notes. You can't, you can't catch it all. Take notes. This is life changing words that Jesus gave us. Life altering words, the Word of God is. Right? As before first service, I was in my office next door and I came across, and right when I went to walk out the door, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart. I'm not saying I heard an audible voice or anything like that. It just spoke in here. And it seems just so simple. But sometimes what the Lord speaks to you is just so simple. And, and I, I can't stop meditating on it this morning. He said, I'm still building my church. Amen. And at first I was like, I know. <laughs> but I've been meditating on that now all morning long. Still building my church. Still building my church. I'm still building my church. Well, what is the church? You and me. We're the church. Not an organization. Not a denomination. Not a structure. You and I. He's still building us. He's still building us. He's still building us. Right? There's still things he's doing in our life, changing our life. He's still building us. You don't know all there is to know, and I don't know all there is to know. But he's still building us. And there's so much more. You know, I believe we're going to spend all eternity seeing the revelation of who God is and his depth and his magnitude. I believe that we haven't even begun to scratch the surface in the revelation of who God is. The depth of his love and his grace and his mercy, it knows no end. He's still building us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit in here I ask as you think through my mind and speak through my vocal cords that this word would come forth unhindered and uninterrupted by any outside force. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us ears to hear, hearts to understand. Lord, that the eyes of our understanding would be open and we would gain insight and revelation into the realm of your spirit, into the realm of the things that you have for our lives to see, to know, and to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Ephesians 5.18 says, don't be drunk with wine because it'll ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? We've looked at that week after week now. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
It goes on to say singing songs, hymns, spiritual songs amongst yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your hearts. My mom did this often. When she was doing the laundry or doing the dishes or making lunch or driving down the road, she would just sing and make music in her heart. Sometimes it was a song that was known, and other times it was just a song that was unknown. Just a made-up song out of her spirit. So I grew up listening and hearing that, but my children didn't necessarily grow up hearing that because, you know, they're young and uh, they weren't in that home. And I came downstairs yesterday and my daughter, 10-year-old daughter, was washing the dishes. That was a miracle in itself. Glory, hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus still lives, I know, I can tell. <laughs> but I came downstairs and nobody was downstairs and I heard from the kitchen her singing this song, just singing a made-up song, singing songs, spiritual songs and hymns and making melody in her heart. To me, it is one of the most beautiful things a person can do, is to do that. Now here it says, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs amongst yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your heart. Who is this for? Is this for us? Is this for every believer? Or is it only for... Someone who's a worship leader. It's for all of us? For everyone. You sure about that? Even if, you're, if you, in your own mind, think, I'm not a good singer. Now, don't ever say you can't sing, because you can sing. Now, you probably can't sell any records, but <laughs> you can sing. And singing, there is something about singing spiritual songs and hymns unto the Lord. There is something about releasing with our mouth and with our words honor and glory to God. Amen. There is something supernatural about it. Have you ever heard a song on the radio, and then you find yourself singing that song almost the whole day. There is something about that. And it is very, very, very important what we meditate on. Because if you ever had heard a song, and you maybe just heard it, you didn't even sing it, but you heard it, and then you found yourself singing it without even thinking consciously about the song, there is an influence that takes place when you hear music and songs. And that influence can either be one that is good or one that is not good. Be filled with the Spirit. Look at this. Singing songs and hymns. It's not period. It's comma. Singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs amongst yourself. Among yourself. And make music to the Lord in your heart. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when the church began, and we see in the book of Acts, we can read about this, but we won't today, it was evident that being filled with the Spirit was something that God gave to believers. Being filled with the Spirit. And you and I, are part of that same church that began in the book of Acts. Now, out of that church, there's all kinds of different denominations and things that have tried to come about as a result of 
what we would call, quote unquote, church, right? But truly, we're just an extension of that original church. God ordained the church into the earth. And the church is really one of the most powerful forces on the earth. The church. You and I. Now, listen, the enemy doesn't want you to know that. And, the, and as soon as I say the word church, the enemy wants you to think, up, oh, denomination, up, oh, religion, up, oh, eh, stay away from it. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the believer. Because that's what the church is, is believers. And God ordained the church, the believers, to be filled with his spirit. And as we worship here today, we are continuing that, 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 that which was put into operation in the book of Acts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, be filled. Say that. Be filled. If God says in his word to be filled, then we can be filled. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know but I, if I can be. I mean, I've wanted to be filled for many years. No, 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 no. If he says be filled, then you can, come on, be filled. Be filled. There's no one whose lid is on too tight that can't be filled. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I don't know where that came from, but you know. I think it's so important. I heard this revelation years ago that every word, every word of God contains within itself the ability to bring it to pass. When God said, be filled, that means automatically we can be filled. Every word. Because every word of God contains power. In Hebrews 11.3, it says that through faith, I know I didn't give it to you guys, but maybe you can put it up there. Hebrews 11.3 says, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Through faith, we understand. How do we understand? Faith. Through faith. You see, there is a understanding that comes to the believer only by faith. Right. Whew. I'm going to say that again. There's an understanding that only comes to the believer by faith. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed. How? How, how were they framed? Was the, was, the, was, the, was the earth framed and come to being from nothing? No. Because God's not nothing. It, was, it came about from the word of God. When God spoke, the framework and the, and the, of the world began to go into operation. Because every word contains within itself the power to bring it to pass when God says it. So when God says, light be, light's just got to be. Right? And you see that now that's, that's, that's God saying then, but now that hasn't... God's word and his power doesn't diminish, doesn't weaken, doesn't wear out. Just because we're now 2018, God's word does not contain any less power. Now, God's words are not just instructions. God's word is empowerment. Because what God says, he now empowers the believer to do it. And when you receive God's word by faith, you have the empowerment to do it. Faith is the connector. Here's the power in God's word. Here's the believer. Faith connects the believer to the power. Amen. Through faith, you understand this. Hallelujah. Now, Remember, go with me to John chapter 2, verse 1. Woo! Hallelujah. John 2, 
Jesus' mother Mary. This woman, she had faith. She had faith. I said she had faith. You're going to have a child. How am I going to have a child? I don't even know, even know a man. Right? She had to receive that message by faith. But in that message contained the power to bring it to pass. Isn't that right? You know, he sent his word. Right? The word was sent. That's Jesus. And in John chapter, what I have you, John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, the next day, I'm going to read New Living Translation, the next day there was a wedding uh, celebration in the village of Canaan in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and, his, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. He says, dear woman, that's not our problem. <laughs> he said, my time is not yet. Faith women have a way of doing this. I said, faith women have a way of doing this. Faith mothers have a way of doing this. I remember as a little guy, going to church, my mom we come help me sing this song? Like six, I don't know. Help you sing a song? Like I need to help you. My mom was, could sing really, really well. Help you sing a song? Sure, you're six, you don't know. Oh yeah, little did I know, front and center stage with a microphone in my hand in front of a whole huge auditorium of people. I felt like saying, woman, my time is not yet. <laughs> but I didn't know better. <laughs> so there I am, standing there in front of everybody, because she's going to start acclimating her kids to singing in front of people. And I'm singing the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. But I just wanted to put a little pizzazz on it. Any wonder I play the saxophone, right? So I sang the B-I-B-L-E-E-E. -E -E. <laughs> e -E -E. It should, the people started cracking up in the whole church. For that's the book for me, me, me. <laughs> I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E-E-E. -E -E. <laughs> the B-I-B-L-E-E-E. -E -E. I never heard the end of that, even as a teenager. Still singing the B-I-B-L-E-E-E-E-E. Yeah, yeah. But this woman, <laughs> Mary, she says, hey, do whatever he says. That's what she tells the disciples. Do whatever he says, right? Now, let me, let me finish reading. Well, standing nearby were six stone water jars. Used for Jewish ceremonial washing, each could hold about 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of the ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. What did they do? They followed his instructions. When the master of the ceremonies tasted the wine that it was uh, water that it was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called to the, the bridegroom over. He, a host always serves the best wine first, he said, and then when everyone had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign in Canaan of Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Now, let me ask you a question. Did these men, these disciples, have to struggle, get stressed out, or even try to logically figure out how putting water into these vats was going to simply accomplish something. Nope. What did they have to do? Just do what he said. Mary had a revelation that he was the Son of God. And this, in this revelation, she knew that when he spoke the word, 
that there was enough power in the words that he was going to speak to bring to pass what was needed. Glory to God. The disciples, it's interesting, they first obeyed Jesus' mother. How many of you had a mother like that? Where, or maybe you had a friend who had a mother like that. You go over to their house, and when you're under their roof, you're abiding by their rules or her rules. And when you're there, you didn't do whatever you felt like doing because this mom is going to make sure that these rules of this household are upheld, right? And it's interesting because I'm thinking of these disciples, grown men, and she turns to them and says, hey, you, you just do what he says. <laughs> okay, yes, you got it, mom. Yep, whatever you say, we're going to do. What do you want us to do? Enough power. No struggle, no stress, no trying to figure it out logically how this is going to help anything or help this situation. They just did what he said. Now, God is not looking for someone with great ability. He's not looking for someone with great ability. Stop trying to qualify yourself. Or, really, stop trying to disqualify yourself. Because God's not looking for people with great ability. These people, these guys, how are they going to do this? But what he's looking for is ability. Excuse me, availability. He's not looking for what you can do. He's looking for, are you willing to be obedient to do what he says? Because he has the ability. But he's just looking for your availability. Because if you're available, he's got all the ability you'll ever need. Amen. Amen. And faith is not limited to time. You know, I'm not a drinker, but from what I know, the best wine is the older wine. And here, he said, you've saved the best to last. Now, the reality is that faith can change and alter time, space, and matter. Yeah. Yeah. Glory to God. I'm going to say that again. Faith can alter time, space, and matter. Faith can do that. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, don't you remember when there was a battle and they prayed and the sun stood still? Their faith stopped time. Scientists to this day that are not even Christians, believers, know that there was some phenomenon that happened that how the sun and the moon stood still and they're trying to logically figure and calculate out how this had somehow got changed. God changed it. God created it. He can change it. How about the Red Sea? Here, the children of Israel delivered from Egypt, backs of, the, the, the enemy's coming at them, and here's a body of water in front of them. We're either going there and drown, or we're going to be overtaken by the Egyptians. And they're just ready to go back to the old bondage they were in at this point. What's he have Moses do? Raise the staff up. What happens to the sea? What happened? The water parted. And why did they cross over? What, what kind of ground was it they crossed over? That's just God showing off, by the way. You know that, right? You know that. I mean, would they have even questioned if it would have been muddy? Logical mind would have said, well, if, yeah, it's muddy. It was just water there a few seconds ago. They didn't even cross through on muddy ground. Because when God does something, nothing's going to slow you down. Time, space, and matter. Faith can alter time, space, and matter. Now I'm getting some looks in here. I get it. Well, pastor, can you just preach to me something that's a little bit more reasonable? Here's the thing. My job isn't to preach what's reasonable. 
because the gospel is the gospel to the unrenewed mind is unreasonable. The Apostle Paul said, don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but be transformed into a new person by changing the way you think. Why would a person need to change the way they think? Because the way they're thinking has been altered. Why had the way they've been thinking be altered? Because the curse is in the earth. And the enemy works hard to get people to think contrary to how God thinks. Jesus called it a mystery. But he said, unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Amen? He says, unto them it's not given, but unto you is given to know. 1 Peter 2, 7 says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now, it's important that I preach the gospel, because the gospel is good news. And I, it's important that I preach the gospel on the level of the supernatural, the spiritual level. Because if I don't, then you'll only believe for what seems possible and logical to your mind. And we don't need a church filled with people that only know how to believe for what's possible and logical to their mind. Because that is not fluid with the, with the gospel. That's not how the gospel is preached. That's not how the gospel lays out. It's not the message of the gospel. If you only hear that, and I only preach that, then you'll never use your faith on the level of the supernatural. And you need the supernatural. God knew we would need the supernatural. The supernatural isn't a whoo No, the supernatural is just something that is beyond what is naturally possible. But we need that. You need your sins forgiven. Naturally, that can't happen. But supernaturally, it can. By the grace of God. Hallelujah. You need healing in your body. Let me say this. You don't need to put so much pressure on the medical field to solve all your problems. Thank God for them. We pray for them. But they can't solve all the problems that are going on with people's health. We need the supernatural. Amen. Well, I don't know how that's supposed to happen, Pastor. I'm just not there yet. Well, get there. And you can get there one step at a time. None of us start there. But we work there. How do we, get, how do we work there? Well, one of the ways I believe that is so important for a Christian's life is praying in the Spirit. And as soon as you talk about praying in the Spirit or praying in tongues, Hope they didn't see me there. <laughs> Hope nobody asked me to go back. Pray, listen, I get it. Praying in the Spirit is not, <laughs> it's not logical to the natural mind. I mean, it's just not. You hear somebody praying in the Spirit. Uh, I mean, you hear some, way somebody, peop, some people pray in the Spirit. I got a question myself. Is that really tongues, God? <laughs> Doesn't make sense to the logical mind. I get it. Right? But if you use the logical mind, it's very difficult to use a logical mind to explain spiritual things. Let me give you a stab at it here. John chapter 10, verse 10. You know it, just quickly. Jesus said, you know, the thief comes but to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I've come that you may have life and life more abundantly. Right? Thief. First of all, we have a thief. You have a thief. I have a thief. Well, the thief comes to do what? Steal, kill, and to destroy. The thief is also trying to steal your identity. Your identity of who you are as a child of God. Trying to keep you from understanding the reality of the power of God that is in you. And so there are, there, are, there are ways that we have been given by God to pray. And we can pray, let me say it like this, the best way I can probably describe this. It's like we can pray in code. And when you can pray in code, you can not only pray, but you can also receive. And your spirit is the great decoder of what the Spirit of God has for you. Because your logical, logical mind can't figure out all that it is that God wants 
to say to you and give to you and direct for you for your life. And when we pray in the Spirit, we begin to see things with our spiritual eyes. Say spiritual eyes. (laughs) And you can begin to see into the realm of the Spirit. Hallelujah. God wants us to see this. He doesn't want us to be ignorant of this. I know it's mysterious to the world, but it's not supposed to be mysterious to us. This is how we're supposed to be able to see things. This isn't kooky. This isn't freaky. This isn't even far out. (laughs) This is supposed to be the reality of what we have as a believer. He said, well, you know, I'm not so sure about that. And, you know, the... um, you know, yeah, okay, it happened in the book of Acts, and yeah, okay, a little bit, you know, here and there. No, it happened a lot, by the way. And, it, and being able to see things spiritually didn't just happen in the New Testament. Do you remember Elisha? Go there, go to, uh, Eli- go to uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17. By the way, the psalmist said in Psalms 119, verse 18, he says, open thou my eyes that I may behold the wondrous things of thy law. Open thy eyes. He's talking about spiritually open my eyes so I can see these things. The book of Elisha, I'll set this up a little bit just for for those you don't know. But here is the man, Elisha. He's a prophet of God, being used by God. And here's Israel and uh, the Jewish nation, and they're, they're being attacked by the enemy. Well, The enemy's trying to attack them. But what happens is Elisha hears from the Spirit of God and reveals to them the maneuvers of the enemy. So the enemy's setting up ambushes, ready to ambush the Israelites. But Elisha hears from the Spirit of God, warns them, and so they don't go that way. So every time the enemy tries to set up an ambush, a sneak attack, it doesn't work. And so now the enemy begins to think, all right, there's a spy in our camp because somehow someone's telling them what we're doing before we do it. And they say, no, 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 no. They said, there's not a spy in our camp. There's a prophet of God in their camp. And he's warning them of our maneuvers before we even do it. And he says, in fact, he knows what goes on in the secrecy of your own bedroom chamber. That's the power of the Spirit of God. That's the spiritual realm that is out there, people. It's all around us. The enemy wants to keep you closed to this, blinded to this, and make you think, well, you know, all that spiritual stuff, I'm not into it. You're into it and you don't even know it. It's happening all around you. And the enemy's whacking you up one side and down the other, and you're going, why does all this happen? Because... You're not seeing what God sees, but he wants to reveal that to you. Because unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Amen. And so, Elisha, he, uh, he's, he's camping in this valley. You can read all this. This is a wonderful story. And he's got this young man with him. And the young man goes out one morning, and the enemy is surrounding him. Why? Because the enemy thinks, hey, If this prophet, find out who he is, find out where he's at, let's go get him. Well, the logical mind, that's all they know to do. But it kind of seems kind of stupid to me that if the guy that's warning Israel what the enemy's going to do might know that the enemy's coming. You get that? If he knows, he knows. So the young man walks out, and they're surrounded by the enemy. Say, surrounded. And so now he's surrounded by the enemy. He goes back in and tells Elisha, we're surrounded. Look at his responses. Elisha prayed. First of all, he says, fear not, the verse before that. Fear not. Because if you're in fear, you can't see. He says, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes. Say, open his eyes. eyes. Now, was the guy blind? He just went out and saw the enemy. He's not talking about his natural eyes. He's talking about the eyes of his spirit. 
he's talking about being able to see into the realm of the spirit. And what happened? And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw. And he what? And he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Lord, open his eyes. Lord, I pray that our eyes are open. Even more. Even more. Even more. And even more. And we see the help that we have. When he saw the horses and the chariots of fire round about, he wasn't he, 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 he wasn't concerned anymore with the enemy. He didn't say, Yeah, I see those chariots of horses and fire, but they're still surrounding us. Nope. Obviously, they were greater. Obviously, when he saw the help that God gave him, he was no longer concerned about the natural forces of the army that was around them. Don't you want to live your life that way? Don't you want to see what God has for you to see? So you can do what he's called you to do? You don't have to be in fear about anything. The Bible says where there's fear, there's torment. But perfected love casts out all fear. You know, the Lord revealed something to me. He said, when that, when that young man saw his help, those chariots and those horses of fire round about, he got a revelation of God's love. Think about that. When you, have, when you see God's help spiritually, when you begin to see it in here, and in the natural, it may look like I'm surrounded. <laughs> I'm surrounded with troubles. I'm surrounded with problems. Seems like everywhere I look, there's problem, 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 problem. But when you begin to see in the realm of the Spirit, and you ask the Lord to open your eyes, and you begin to read the Word, and you begin to pray in the Spirit, I'm telling you, you begin to see your help. And when you begin to see your help, you're no longer overwhelmed by what the circumstances look like. Hallelujah. Jesus asked the disciples, he said, he said to them, first of all, he said to the disciples, he said, who do men say that I am? Remember that? Who do men say that I am? And they say, well, one say this, one say that, you know, one of the prophets, Jeremiah, Elijah. And he says, okay, all right, cool. Who do you say that I am? Right? Who do you say that I am? It's the, I get it. The world doesn't get what we get. They don't see what we see. The unbeliever they don't see what we see. They don't know what we know. They, don't, they can, they could, if they would just simply believe, but they just don't get it. So don't bounce what's right or what's real based on what the world thinks is real because they don't see it. They don't see what you see. Amen. And so he says, who do you say that I am? What does Peter? Peter steps up and says something, doesn't he? Something pretty amazing. He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. <clears throat> Woo! Didn't he? Who do men say that I am? He says, who do you say that I am? Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed. Say blessed. blessed. You know what blessed means? Empowered. You're empowered. You're empowered. Blessed, empowered, right? Art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Talking about revealed knowledge. All of a sudden, Peter got a hold of a truth saw a truth, received a truth about who Jesus was. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed art thou. Look what happens next. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
the gates of hell. When you, get, when you receive revelation, when you see what God sees, I'm telling you, all of hell and all that hell has to throw at you can't prevail against you. When you get a revelation of your healing, all of hell can't prevail against you. When you get a revelation of your prosperity, all of hell can't prevail against you. I mean, everything can look like it falls apart, breaks this, that, and the other, and God has a way to supernaturally just cause an increase to come into your life. And the trick of the enemy is to try to get you so close-sighted that all you look at are the circumstances. And if you feel like the circumstances are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, simply just ask the Lord, open my eyes. Help me see what you see. Begin to pray in the Spirit. Begin to sing songs and spiritual songs. Allow the filling of the Holy Spirit to fill you and reveal to you. When he fills you, I'm telling you, it just opens the expanse of what he has for you. And you begin to see things. All of a sudden, your, 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 your problems go, and they just begin to just shrink. You ever heard of a tumor shrinking? That's what, that's what the Holy Spirit, when you get a revelation, it's like the Holy Spirit will just grab a hold of that and just begin to shrink it down until it just gone out of your life. Open your eyes. Then he goes on to the next verse. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The uh, New Living says this. Whatever you Forbid on earth, forbid on earth, will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. This heaven isn't the heaven, isn't the realm where God is. The Bible describes, use the word, the, the Bible uses the word heaven, and there's actually three heavens. There's three layers. It's like, you could almost say atmospheres. You know how we have different atmospheres? Well, there's the heaven where God lives, but there's also the heaven which could be referred to as the spiritual realm. Whatever you permit or whatever you forbid will be forbidden or permitted in that spiritual realm. Remember when he said, Paul said, our wrestle is not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the spiritual realm he's talking about. He says, whatever you permit will be permitted. Whatever you allow will be allowed, right? Whatever you forbid will be forbidden. Well, what do you mean? How do I know? You don't without a revelation. That's why you need a revelation to be able to see into that realm so you know what to permit and what to forbid. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. There are things that in here the Lord will speak to my heart about. Oh, I can, I can just sit on them. Or I can either begin to forbid some things. I can either permit them or I can forbid them. And there's been a many of things that the Lord has put in my heart. And I said, in the name of Jesus. Now I'll use these words. I bind you, Satan, and every work of the enemy that tries to bring confusion into this situation. You will not bring confusion. You will not bring division in that situation in Jesus' name. That family will serve you all the days of their life. They and their household will serve the Lord. And it'll just, just, it'll just come up in my spirit all of a sudden. Just, just start praying for some people. Now again, that can come up in your, your spirit, my spirit. We're, all, we're spiritual beings. And if you're a Christian, you're alive unto God. But you can just sit there and say, well, you know. You know, I had a feeling something wasn't right, but I didn't want to say anything. Ever heard that? Yeah. You should have said something. Yeah. Because the power and authority is, is in your words. Yeah. And whatever you forbid, 
will be forbidden. Hallelujah. There are some things trying to happen that we need to forbid from happening. And you need the Holy Spirit's help to know. Because your mind and, 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 and your mind can't, can't figure all that out. Doesn't know it all. Doesn't have all the answers. Oh, but your spirit has such great capacity. Your spirit has capacity beyond what you have any idea of. Because your spirit is alive unto God. And the Holy Spirit is in your spirit, bearing witness with your spirit concerning the things of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Did you get something out of this? I'm going to end there. Stand to your feet, please. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, one of the uh, names of the Holy Spirit is Helper. He's our Helper. And when you sing and spiritual songs, like we were reading earlier, he'll help you. Be, uh, be filled with the Spirit singing songs. He'll help you. So let's say you're dealing with an addiction. And, you know, you get the craving, you, the, the mind, the thought comes, and, you know, uh, uh, light it up. Go crack it open, whatever it is, you know. Have you ever thought about beginning just to sing spiritual songs in the middle of that? Hmm? When you do that, you receive the filling. He begins to pour into you. When he pours into you, that's the Holy Spirit. He's your helper. He's your helper. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for each and every person here. And Lord, right now, I pray specifically for those who are dealing with some or any type of addiction. that they would know who their help is, that they would go to your help, that they would rely on your help, being filled with the Spirit. Lord, I pray that the eyes of our understanding are enlightened, are open to see and to know and we pray, Lord, for loved ones, family members, friends who don't know you or who aren't living for you. Maybe they know of you, but they're not living for you. And they've almost chalked the things of God up and the things of the Holy Spirit up as just kind of like whatever. Lord, that your Holy Spirit, we pray that their eyes are open. Just as Elisha prayed for that young man, we pray that their eyes are open. And Lord, help us with our own spiritual eyes to see what it is that you desire to reveal to us by the power of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you want to get saved, man. You want to get saved. I don't know how to put any plainer than that. You say, well, why do I need to be saved? Hey, you need to be saved. God loves you. He sent his son to die for you. And you need to be saved. Bottom line. It's the greatest thing anybody can ever experience on the planet. I'm not talking about religion, not even talking about it. I'm just talking about a relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's the most beautiful thing that can happen to a person. If you're here and you've never done that, prayer couples, if you'd come forward at this time and be available to pray with people, if you're here and you've never made that decision, you can't confidently say that you know that you know that you know that you're a Christian, that you're saved. We want to open this altar up for you 
for prayer to come up here and let us pray with you. Let us have the great opportunity and honor to pray with you. Or if you'd like prayer or need prayer in any area of your life, or you know someone, we will join our faith with you concerning your miracle. Remember, you're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Bless going in and bless going out. Everything you set your hand to, you're the lender, not the borrower. You're good looking. You're dismissed. Worthy is the Lamb Seated on the throne Crown you now in many crowns Reign victorious I am lifted up Jesus of God, the darling of heaven, crucified, worthy is the Lamb, worthy Thank you for this love, Lord.